during the territorial period, newspapers are writing terrible things about the Mexicans, that they'll sell their land for cheap. The mentality is still to come into Castilla County and purchase cheap land. They probably Googled something like cheap land Colorado. The reason that I bought the land that I did, I'm not gonna lie, the land's cheap here. Hello, I'm pleased you're taking the time from your busy schedule to view this video. We are in the San Luis Valley in Costilla County. Agriculture has always been pretty much the element here. In the 1970s, the land went from agricultural to supposedly residential subdivisions with these big tracts of land being divided into five acre plots and sold in newspapers and magazines. There were TV ads. I pretty much lived in Colorado my entire life and just happened to run across the ranch last summer. Uh, so my wife and I were heading down to Taos, down in the uh, south central part of Colorado. Our 35 acre parcels start at $1,000 per acre. But it was this era of land by mail, and lots of it was scammy. You look out in what we call the, the Llanos, it's all sagebrush, chamiso. You would never think of living out there. The ranch is a little deceiving uh, because there's a lot of sage. You have to have a little trust in the signs. Most of the street signs over the years have disappeared. All right, Nessa, there, yeah. maybe if we get up here on a hill, I can kind of figure out where we're at. Roads are well maintained. Rains wash out the roads all the time, and they get in really terrible shape. You might wonder if this is even a road. Some of them get giant anthills. Some of them get prairie dog colonies in the middle, and you'll see little heads popping up as you drive down. It's really hard to actually live out here. And indeed, the Federal Trade Commission came after the people who subdivided this land. They forced them to offer refunds to anybody who wanted one. Really, only in the last 10 years or so, when solar panels got affordable and cities started getting super expensive, did people actually use this land to live on. Several of my neighbors bought their five acres sight unseen. They buy land sight unseen. They get here, they realize they have no infrastructure, no water, no sewer. The developers didn't put in any services. They learn that it's really easy to get lost. It looks a lot the same. And it's hard to find your property. Um, but I think I know where we are. Well, that's what Google's for. <laughs> what if Google don't work? We find them miscellaneously driving up and down roads because they know the road their property's on, but there's no way to find it. Call 888-316-LAN. And this guy drives by and then he comes back through, and he drives by and comes back through. And he says, you lived here? And I said, yeah, most of my life. And he says, well, I got a lot out here in San Luis Valley Estates. And he lays out this beautiful map on the trunk of his car. And there was a grade school, a junior high, high school, green belts, many malls. I mean, I'd have bought a piece of ground and I grew up here. When I got done talking to him, he got in his car and left mad. It's not one bit different than when you get on an airplane and in a seat back ahead of you, here's this beautiful magazine about everything, Rio de Janeiro, every place you could possibly fly to. And here's a full page colored brochure of Sanchez Reservoir peddling Wild Horse Mesa. A summer view of Sanchez Reservoir. And Sanchez is one of only a few lakes in Colorado where you can own property all the way to the water's edge. Wild Horse Mesa has no ties at all to Sanchez Reservoir. But I have yet to see a sales brochure from Wild Horse Mesa. Does that show Sanchez Reservoir up toward Calabria Peak? You don't see it. Those tactics still exist, which is part of the reason that we are in the situation that we are with the subdividing of our county. Right now I'm looking at the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. The mountains are private, which astonished me when I learned it. You just assume 
Colorado's highest mountains are on public land. So that all by itself is fascinating, right? And leads you back to the history of where we are. Colorado was Ute country. This was once the homeland of the Utes, homeland to Navajos, homeland to Hakari Apaches. There was already a community here where the land and the water was being used. And we have to remember that and we should pay tribute to that. So it has a long history. We have a long period of Spanish rule starting in really the founding of Santa Fe in the late 1500s. Then Mexican rule after that, 1821 to 1848. During that time, the Mexican government, seeing a threat sort of from the U.S., they saw a need to sort of lay claim to this area. So they issued these large land grants, Sangre de Cristo land grant being one of them, which is basically today's Costilla County plus portions of Taos County in, in New Mexico. This was a land grant, a community land grant awarded by the Mexican government to settlers that are still here today. 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe gave this to the U.S. By the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, these residents are able to vote. But there's a disparity. They're now in an English-speaking territory, English laws, and new settlers coming in. Newspapers are writing terrible things about the Mexicans, that they'll sell their land for cheap. And of course, Treaty of Guadalupe kind of changed the land grant status. This was settled more in the Spanish tradition of dividing land into long vara strips or long lots or extensiones. There's different words for the same thing. Instead of using the PLSS, the big grid system that's used across the state and across the West. It's very difficult to think about the Sangre de Cristo land grant and how these settlers lost their land. This area has sort of have seen a lot of power struggles um, between wealthy land speculators, sort of the original group of settlers that came up here to farm, you know, subsistence farm. Starting in 1864 with William Gilpin, who purchased this land grant and even then sort of attempted to uh, remove rights and land from the original settlers and their descendants. And they had this philosophy that they could sell ground. So they say the first subdivision was of the Sangre de Cristo land grant into the Costilla estate and the Trinchera estate. We're now on the former Costilla estate. When Gilpin purchased the land grant from Charles Bobien, then he's, he determines that he's going to create these two estates and, and um, they're going to speculate on it and whatnot. They split Carlos Bobion's ground on the high rise between San Luis and Fort Garland. And William Gilpin tried to make a real estate business out of this in water. It didn't work. They did the best they could to keep their investors happy. The bottom line here is water. They knew from the very beginning, land and water, land and water. Hey, this is a place to grow. You know, we're away from Denver, it's an open area. We ought to be able to make it work. But figure out a way to market the land, that they had to have water to make it work. Water in our acequias come off the lower and the higher watershed, both sit in our backyard on that land grant known as La Sierra. We get very little rainwater here because we're a high alpine valley. So the water in our acequias is definitely, like we've heard a million times, the lifeblood of this community. Water is a community resource rather than a commodity to be bought and sold. So it's a one landowner, one vote system. The land system, definitely, is a, is a big thing that changed, and the Asequia system. You had the Calabria River, and you had the Costilla Creek, and that was the only water that was available. The Calabria was supposed to have been over 170,000 acre feet of water. So, down here, they developed 25,000 acres of ground, put ditches and canals to them. And to make all of this possible, 
the Castilla development partners built a giant reservoir by San Luis, the Sanchez Reservoir. And Van Geese was trying to justify getting extra or getting water into Sanchez Reservoir from the smaller tributaries of the Glaber Creek. Okay, Mr. Salazar is wasting half the water he's using. Henceforth, we can use that water in Sanchez Reservoir. They filed on about half of the first water rights, claiming that they had been given too much water, which may or may not have been. The earliest lawsuit that Freehold Land and Development Company had was versus the local natives that were using the water a long time before they ever showed up. And that was a feud that was fought in the courts from about 1920 till the last one was three years ago, I think. I mean, it's settled that water was supposed to go in the Sanchez Reservoir. It was cut and dried in the law. The judge signed off on it. But there's always questions. This is where we measure the flow into Sanchez, and this is after it is collected water from Culebra, Vallejos, and San Francisco. They were supposed to have meetings, and get together, and come up with a method to administer those Hallert or freehold water rights wasn't followed through with and left in limbo. The state engineer issued a letter that said, you guys have not carried through, to direct the water commissioner to administer this way, and that's where I'm at today. It is awful complicated. Anytime a government takes over from another government and tries to honor the previous government's conditions. There's two total different thought processes there that, that could meet, but more than likely won't meet. A whole lot of the hassles from freehold and custody estates and, and water rights today are probably tied back to that. I think Castilla Estates saw its future in farmers being able to buy land cheap and start new lives out here. And so the infrastructure they built was around irrigation and the railroad. There's another abandoned house. They were uh, marketing to farmers and hoping whole communities might relocate. substance agriculture. If they didn't raise it or make it, they didn't have it. And that's kind of a beautiful part of history because everybody worked together to survive. That's my grandpa's family, his parents and brothers and sisters. And then that and over there is my two grandparents, dad's parents and my mother's parents. They were the fourth generation. We've been here for three. And that is my grandmother's mother. Grandma's stepdad was a carpenter on this house. That's F.E. Anderson and Willa on their wedding day in Lincoln, Nebraska. 1913, I believe, or 12. That's my dad and mom and his two sisters. And then that's dad and mom on their wedding day. And that dad and his later, dad and mom in their later years down in Texas, wasn't it? My mom and grandparents came from Germany in 1925. My grandpa was an indentured servant to a cousin of his for five years to pay for the passage over. Grandpa worked his way up to 160 acres, Minnesota. And it was dry. He didn't raise much of a crop. A friend of his mentioned this area with irrigation. So Grandpa wrote letters to the company and they wrote letters back to him and he climbed on a train. The railroad was already built to here. Here's a place, $1.25 an acre. 
they'll guarantee you water. We got it made. There it is back there. And they didn't have the fancy pictures that we've got today, but they probably had pretty brochures showing some guy out there raising his peas and herding his hogs or whatever. Grandpa told me one of the questions that was asked was religion. Sneed Investment Company stated that well, you, you'd be a whole lot happier if you're around people of your own religion. And that part of their real estate development. It was a group of people that come into the San Luis Valley. Mormon settled Eastdale. New Santa Cash was settled Presbyterian. Mesita, formerly known as Hamburg, was Methodist. So Hiroso was settled Seventh-day Adventist and we had a Seventh-day Adventist Academy out east of town. Went to the 10th grade. And the porch that you walk into my house was made out of part of that academy. And a grain elevator too. They were planning on a full-scale town. Okay, you're standing right here now. We own this whole block and part of this one. That was mapped out for a park. And the reason they mapped it out for a park is the irrigation ditch come in from, and come down and, and cross the railroad track here to where that hangar's sitting and 10 acres were irrigated out of it. So there was water in that park at one time and there was trees. And then east of town, these were all garden tracks. And this was known as the Martin Parks Edition. And then the academy sat there. Uh, not many of them got moved into though. People come down and look at it and thought, I ain't living here. Uh, you know, it was a good idea. It was a lot of high hopes. And if the 50,000 acre feet of water would have been there, maybe it would have grown. But we didn't have it. Grandpa told me this piece of ground had to be broke out of sagebrush. 1914, they moved down here. 1916, they left. Come back to stay in 21. Tried to farm. Run a drugstore in town so he could support a wife and three kids on a 25-acre farm. And wound up with a grocery store. This was part of the general merchandise store. My job before I got on a school bus in the morning when they moved us up to Santa Cash was to fill the pop cooler. Pepsi, Coca-Cola, knee-high, uh, barges. Prior to the 30s, we had three grocery stores in town. We had a Ford dealership in town. We had one hotel and three motels. Two doctors. There's one you know. A great bet. The way Grandpa made the store work, he started a trucking company. And Grandpa would lock the store up, five o'clock, climb in a bobtail truck, go over the top of the old Levita path, unload what he had, and load up and come back and open the store up the next day. He'd sleep for about an hour and a half in the middle of the day. And that's why we have managed to survive the way we have. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just something you do. But well, in the early days of settlement down here, granted we had a railroad, but you were still responsible for your survival. That philosophy carried through from 1800s to probably 50s or 60s, somewhere in there. The early 1900s, they marked out where freight was supposed to go to. Quest the store, Quest the Mercantile Company, and you can see this shed is still there. As a little kid, I can remember loading semis of field peas. I'd come home from school, change clothes, and come down here and help Robert and his brother-in-law, Fred Vigil, clean and sack field peas. 
about, I don't know, 12 or 13, Robert would bet me a Coke and a candy bar that I couldn't carry 200 pounds the length of the warehouse. So I'd carry 200 pounds the length of a warehouse. And it all dates back to a man that dad and grandpa had working for him back in the early 50s that would load box cars to get the weight on the cars. And this gentleman would carry a sack under one arm and a sack by the ears on the other. So that was a story that I had to live up to. And I was dumb enough to try to do it. 31 or two, he wound up with a post office. Come on in. My grandpa bought those post office boxes in Creed, Colorado in 1933. The doors with the eagle on them was built before the 1890s. And the post office come in and said, well, you gotta have key boxes, you can't have these. And the customers told the post office where to go. <clears throat> Anyhow, through the years, we've kind of maintained the post office in town. Don't know why. Show you this. Kind of watch your step. It's kind of dark in here. Main power switch. Cleaner. I, when I was a kid, I talked to old timers. Just talked about skating all the way down to the Grand River from San Luis. Okay, 1952 was the last time these people told me they ever skated the Calabria. I think the auger is just, no, that's a hard car to clear on that end. You know, why did they leave? It's pretty cut and pick and simple. They run out of water. If you can't raise a crop, you can't stay there. The big elephant in the room. Prior to 1900, the state never took any records on the Claver Creek. When they first started developing Sanchez in the Claver watershed, two years worth of actual figures is what they allowed the water company to claim the water. I think it was the seventh largest earthen dam in the world at the time never filled up, the water never really came, and all of the plans for irrigating this land eventually dried up. They didn't know where the water was. They didn't really know anything when they drew these plats and put them out. And they, they built a lot of canal, but water never made it. And the remnants of some little reservoirs and some irrigation ditches are all around here. Some of these things were put in that really never worked at all. When they built Sanchez Reservoir, they had the idea that they could come out of the stabilization, come along the Wild Horse Mesa. And run it all the way down to Costilla, New Mexico. And come down to Costilla Creek where the old Mormons took a diversion out for number two, come in and tie on the, the Cerro Canal. That was the original intention to irrigate Peroso area. But from Sanchez Stabilization Pond to that diversion on the river, water never got there. Not one time. According to Grandpa, they spent three weeks trying to get water past that alluvial slide. I can't imagine that there was as much water as how they planned. Water makes people have dreams for sure. And sometimes I think, well, the people who bought this land were deluded by their dreams of this new prosperity. But I also think the people who developed it were deluded. And you're in this sort of abandoned area, not abandoned by everybody. Lots of people live out here now, but the greater dreams that once filled this place have gone away. I've learned to live under these constraints. Growing up under the constraints that I've grown up under. You plant a hardy enough alfalfa that it stays dormant 
till you get water. And it's hardy enough in the fall of the year that you don't have to keep it alive. Effie's grandson, Donald's son. I can't live with anything better than that. That's it. And there's a whole lot of other people in this area that have the same legacy. It's just there. And that's why we have managed to survive the way we have. On the next Colorado Voices, subdivided land continues to be marketed on the high desert as the cost of living skyrockets. More people are trying to survive on these isolated prairie lands. It's always been my dream to own property, and that's why we're out here. I wouldn't go back. <laughs>